Okay. Well, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for coming. Welcome to the Clean Arctic Alliance's webinar, The Arctic Ocean, the Canary and the Coal Mine, question mark. Um, Organised to mark World Ocean Day and held on the eve of the International Maritime Organization's Marine Environment Protection Committee. Um, the usual um, housekeeping um, stuff up front. Um, First of all, um, as you probably have seen already from a little message on your screen, the webinar is being recorded um, and we'll make that available afterwards for sharing. Um, we'll, um, you know, after the presentations, there'll be questions, of course, um, and we'll ask you to use the, the Zoom um, quick Q&A &A, um, option, um, which you'll find near the bottom of your screen. Um, We'll, we'll of course try to answer all the questions during the Q and A, um, but if this not if this isn't possible, we'll try and um, sort out answers for you um, after the event. Uh, so let's have a look. Um, okay, I think we're there. Um, thank you again. Um, the Arctic is in crisis um, and changing rapidly, with serious global heating related impacts on local wildlife and communities and with major implications for sea level rise and the climate globally. Last month, the Arctic Council's AMAP working, working group reported that the Arctic is now warming three times faster than the average warming across the globe. Also last month, the separate new study indicated that the Greenland ice sheet is nearing a major tipping point and that one, one to two meters of sea level rise is probably already locked into the system. And only last week, new research discovered that the Arctic sea ice is thinning twice as fast as previously thought. And while some might be tempted to view this as good news for shipping in the Arctic, it's not good news for the planet or for Arctic inhabitants, or indeed for shipping in the longer term. Apologies for using the phrase that combines both fossil fuels and animal welfare issues, but in many respects, at this point, the Arctic appears to be the canary in the climate change coal mine. There can be no doubt that the Arctic is in crisis. And if the Arctic is in crisis, then we are all in crisis. With the loss of summer sea ice and easier access to previously inaccessible resources, shipping traffic in the Arctic is growing and is expected to continue to grow as melting further opens up sea lanes. This is bad news. Shipping is not just a major contributor of climate pollution. If it was a country, it would be the sixth largest emitter of greenhouse gases but it is also responsible for significant black carbon emissions, an important short-term climate forcer that accelerates ice melt. Bold action by all polluters, including shipping, is urgently needed to protect the Arctic summer sea ice, the glaciers and the ice sheet, and the communities that depend on Arctic ice. The whole world looks to the IMO to address international shipping's contribution to the Arctic climate crisis. This it can and must do, by aggressively tackling emissions of both greenhouse gases and black carbon. With the help of today's speakers, we're going to consider the plight of communities in the changing Arctic. We're going to look at the changes that are taking place in the area. And we're going to consider what has to happen if shipping is to play a proper role in responding to the Arctic climate crisis. As I mentioned earlier, the timing of today's event is no accident. It's World Oceans Day but it's also the eve of the 76th session of the IMO's Marine Environment Protection Committee meeting, where important decisions will be made about these issues. We have four speakers today, and then we'll come to the Q&A discussion session. We'll move straight from one speaker to the next with a brief introduction. However, you can submit questions at any time. But they'll be answered at the end of the final session, so after the last of the speakers. Our first speaker is Austin Amasuk, Austin is joining us from Nome, Alaska, where he's a marine advocate with Karawak. Austin, you have the floor. Good morning from Nome, Alaska. Thank you, John. Uh, once again, my name is Austin Amasuk. I'm zooming in this morning from Nome, Alaska, and uh, very pleased to be here. I'm also very pleased to share a perspective about the Arctic, which I think has uh, uh, lessons perhaps 
uh, for us all, for the planet. Uh, obviously, uh, as uh, was noted, uh, my Arctic homeland is changing dramatically. And uh, I suppose we are all asking how that will impact the planet and how it will impact us. Um, this opening slide is, uh, is how my homeland looked uh, approximately a month and a half ago. Uh, this uh, particular uh, image uh, is an image of when most of us began our uh, subsistence uh, season on, uh, on shorefast ice, hunting from the shorefast ice for seals. And unfortunately, this sort of image, uh, significant shorefast ice uh, that we use to hunt uh, and gather foods uh, that we harvest for this time of the year uh, is becoming rarer uh, and rarer. And most of us are contemplating just how it's going to impact our future. Uh, before I go any further though, of course, uh, if you have any questions uh, uh, for me, I can be reached at that email address below. Um, I work for uh, a tribal organization, uh, which uh, you can access uh, via www.kawark.org. Uh, there you can uh, find uh, links uh, to the Marine program, uh, which I work in. I've been with Kawark since 2014 uh, in their Marine program, which was originally established or which was established and uh, is established to address the impacts of uh, increased uh, shipping uh, in the Arctic. So um, with that, I'll, I have a few slides. Uh, I'll, I'll speak for uh, just a, a few moments and uh, turn it over to my colleagues and hopefully uh, have a dialogue with uh, folks uh, here, here today. There aren't uh, canaries uh, in the Arctic, of course, uh, but there are uh, species uh, in the Arctic uh, that are very reflective of the kind of change that's occurring here. I suppose if there were an appropriate bird uh, for the Arctic to gauge uh, what's happening, it would certainly be seabirds. Uh, within the last decade, uh, seabirds uh, have experienced uh, dramatic uh, declines in productivity. Uh, in the upper, upper left uh, hand corner there of this slide are, are mer eggs uh, and gall eggs, uh, which we uh, historically and presently harvest uh, rather significantly. Uh, a, a, a huge part of our subsistence, subsistence diet. Unfortunately, um, seabirds uh, are, are experiencing declines uh, over the last decade. And unfortunately this year, it seems to be occurring. Uh, folks in our region have reported already uh, before our summer even has begun, uh, dead seabirds, uh, starving seabirds, uh, skinny seabirds. Unfortunately, it looks like we may be in the Bering Strait region uh, experiencing uh, go, or going to be experiencing another dramatic uh, seabird decline and, and seabird productivity. Uh, throughout the last decade, um, our, uh, our, our rivers have experienced wild fluctuations in salmon returns, uh, salmon declines. Uh, you know, fish resources are, are a significant part of our diet. They make up a significant part of our, our time uh, now, uh, uh, occupying uh, much of the much of our time in the field. Uh, unfortunately, you know, climate change uh, is, uh, appears to be a significant factor in how salmon returns and salmon, um, salmon abundances uh, occur and, and how, they, how they behave. In the bottom of the screen is a, is a picture of a spotted seal, a portion of a spotted seal hollow uh, below my family's camp. And uh, for as long as I can remember, uh, spotted seals uh, have hauled out uh, in large numbers uh, below my family's camp, uh, numbering into the several hundreds. Uh, unfortunately, uh, with climate change, uh, seal species, ice seal species, ice dependent marine mammals are declining rather significantly. And uh, seal hollows, like the one in the bottom image, um, may be a, may in fact be a, a historic. Uh, uh, just a historic image uh, as we go into the as we go into the future. This this sort of image may not may not may not be in our future as ice seal uh, populations decline. Long time uh, marine mammal hunters uh, like myself were contemplating the localized extinction of some marine mammal species, uh, are especially the ice associated marine mammal. Uh, this is a uh, a satellite image of. Um, what I consider to be the uh, 
maximal uh, ice extent uh, in our region on or about March 22nd of this year. And um, on the on the right hand portion of the image is the coastline of Alaska. On the left hand portion is the coastline of Chukotka, or Russia. And then uh, in the bottom of the image, uh, there is St. Lawrence Island. And to uh, someone who may not be familiar with the Arctic, this may seem like a lot of ice. It certainly is. It certainly is a lot of white, of course. Um, but to the uh, experienced eye, there are some significant features that are that are not there that are that are missing, and that is uh, a significant shorefast ice north of St. Lawrence Island, significant shorefast ice shelf uh, north of the Seward Peninsula, and and an ice shelf uh, that I, that is that used to exist in Eastern Northern Sound are no longer there, and so while it may seem like a lot of ice, there are significant features that aren't there anymore because of climate change, because of, because of the uh, loss essentially of a, a major cryospheric uh, element and that is significant shortcuts. This of course has bearing on how uh, marine mammals uh, utilize our environment as well as us. Unfortunately, climate change has a uh, significant uh, human impacts, and that is uh, related to uh, cultural sites and coastal erosion. It's my understanding that uh, most of the uh, sea level rise that we're experiencing now is mostly related to thermal expansion of, of the ocean. And that of course has uh, impacts to cultural sites. Uh, this image here is uh, an image of, um, of a historic and prehistoric uh, grave site uh, that my family has caretaken for for a very long time. Uh, it used to be uh, one quarter of a mile from, from the ocean. Uh, it, it is now uh, being uh, eroded significantly. I've not zoomed into the image because there are human remains as well as uh, cultural remains uh, in, in this photo. Uh, and so we are of course uh, questioning and very concerned about what future warming could occur if of course uh, ice caps melt, like, it, it, and significant ice melt occurs. Because as we know right now, uh, the kind of, the, the amount of sea level rise just related to thermal expansion is, is significant uh, and is very impactful. As John mentioned, uh, there are very powerful uh, economic interests uh, uh, seeking to create an Arctic vision uh, for the Arctic. Uh, we do not in the Arctic uh, want that uh, vision to come at our expense. Uh, we try as much as possible to be involved in the, the international arena, the national and local and statewide arena, to make sure that things that are happening in the Arctic aren't impacting us. Unfortunately, um, that's being uh, that's being impacted by other very powerful uh, economic interests throughout the globe. Uh, here in my hometown uh, community of Nome, uh, there are, are, are significant uh, large-scale impacts from fishing, militarization, uh, deep draft uh, port development, as well as well as uh, increased shipping, and this is a, a picture from uh, June uh, 2019, uh, looking uh, south uh, from the port of Nome. On the horizon is a large uh, scale, uh, uh, large a large uh, chemical tanker, uh, a large oil tanker, and uh, in the image in the image there you can see the stack emissions uh, trailing off to the west. Uh, I've I visually tracked those uh, air emissions for 11 miles. I reported the visual quality, visual air violations to our our federal EPA as well as state DEC. Unfortunately, there's very little enforcement in much of rural Alaska, particularly Western Alaska. And so it, there's very little, uh, very little uh, mitigation that can occur because of the lack of enforcement uh, in, in Western Alaska and the Arctic. And so the impacts of these large scale, uh, large scale commercial, uh, large scale commercial uh, activities uh, may largely go unregulated. One of the, one of the uh, original uh, concerns that tribes in our region had from increased shipping was an, an increase in marine debris. And unfortunately in 2020, uh, that materialized to a very significant extent. Uh, our entire region of Western Alaska experienced a, a novel significant foreign marine debris event involving plastics, petrochemicals used, used, uh, used uh, commercial fishing gear, uh, foodstuffs, uh, and uh, this resulted, unfortunately, in us having to weed through the trash to harvest our subsistence resources. Uh, we, uh, 
didn't receive any any federal or state assistance uh, in this significant uh, foreign marine debris event. Uh, much of these uh, much of these much of these uh, articles uh, were marked uh, with uh, Russian or Korean markings, and uh, to date we have no idea who was the culprit, uh, and uh, we also don't have any resources uh, now or uh, in place now if this happens again. So we in the Arctic are very concerned about what will happen. Uh, we uh, are very concerned how authority will be used because uh, authority, of course, uh, will have an impact on how we live. And, um, you know, most of us, uh, you know, at this time of the year, we're transitioning from uh, the, the, the winter season to the summer season. And most of us are creating foodstuffs like this, uh, seal oil uh, that is used to preserve greens for our, throughout the summer, throughout the winter. And so the foods that we harvest, um, you know, they are, are, are very important uh, for us because foodstuffs that have to come to the Arctic are very expensive. They have to come for a very long way. And uh, the, the foods that we do harvest, uh, though limited, are, are hardy, uh, but depend upon cold for their tremendous productivity. So uh, with that, um, a thank you. And uh, I'll hand it off uh, to our next uh, speaker. Thank you very much, um, Austin, um, for you know an invaluable um, look at what life in a changing Arctic is like. Um, thank you very much indeed for that. Um, our next speaker is Pam Pearson, co-chair of the Climate and Clean Air Coalition's Agricultural Initi Initiative and director of the International Cryosphere Climate Initiative. Um, Pam, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you, Austin, for that very direct look at the changes within the Arctic. What I'm going to concentrate on is the changes the Arctic is beginning to drive outside of the Arctic. And my main point is that the Arctic is no longer an early warning system. Sometime over the past couple of decades, I think climatologists and historians are going to look back and say that the changes in the Arctic are becoming a driver of climate change and not simply an early warning system. Temperature records are being set in the Arctic uh, every year. This spring has seen some of the earliest high temperatures ever uh, and the highest temperatures in summer in the Arctic Circle ever measured were reached last year. We're seeing a lot of loss of not just the extent of sea ice, but thick and older sea ice. And that's been an essential change in the structure of the Arctic ecosystem. Uh, the Arctic Ocean is growing warmer, fresher, and also more acidic. It absorbs a lot of carbon dioxide, cold water, and fresher water absorbs CO2 more readily. And therefore, these parts of the world are becoming more acidic and making it much more difficult for shell building organisms to uh, exist. And Arctic sea ice, as has been touched on earlier, has been disappearing uh, to a greater and greater extent during all parts of the year, not just in summer, but we are likely to begin seeing summer ice-free periods beginning at around 1.7 degrees. We're looking right now at a minimum overshoot uh, if we don't increase our climate ambition of about 2.7 degrees, at which point we'll see ice-free periods for many months out of the year. And we're currently on target, unfortunately, for about 4.5 degrees. So um, Arctic sea ice and acidification, why should we care about this? And uh, it's because of the feedbacks to the global climate system. One comes to fisheries and organisms within the Arctic. Arctic sea ice, thick multi-year sea ice, should be thought of almost as the coral reefs of the Arctic. It's a very rich ecosystem, as you can see from this below water picture. Um, and species such as cod is just one example are really being pressured by these changes. They're being pressed by acidification further south. You're getting warmer waters coming in and uh, mid latitude species coming in from the south. And parts of the near Arctic oceans are becoming Atlantified with this warmer water and that sandwiches these Arctic species with no habitat really left for migration. <clears throat> 
Permafrost is affected by loss of sea ice. It's associated with that. We're already seeing losses today. And that's important because that decreases our carbon budget. Uh, the amount of carbon that humans can emit is decreased here by the amount in light pink that is coming from permafrost will be coming at higher levels at 1.5 and even higher levels at 2 degrees C. And these amounts are substantial and they will continue for a couple of centuries after initial thaw. We're already looking today at emissions about the size of Japan's annually. As temperatures grow, those emissions at about 1.5 will be equal to Canada's annually. If we start exceeding two degrees C, we're going to be looking at committed permafrost carbon emissions equal to about those of China or the US today. So what we're doing is committing future generations to offset those negative emissions for a couple of centuries. And for that reason, we need to maintain as much sea ice and keep temperatures as low as possible. And finally, there's sea level rise from Greenland, which affects the entire globe. That's a direct impact combined of greenhouse gases and black carbon, which I'll talk about in a moment. But it's driven by sea ice loss. It's driven by thawed permafrost carbon feedbacks. And there was a paper that just came out a few weeks ago showing that southwestern Greenland is beginning to reach melt rates beyond which there may be no return, committing us to maybe two or three meters sea level rise over the long term from Greenland alone. So CO2 drives Arctic warming and acidification both. And it's worth an important noticing that uh, the daily average exceeded 420 parts per million twice this spring. Remember, April 30th uh, of this year, 2021, it's the first time that the daily average exceeded 420. It happened again later in May. Um, but in the Arctic, black carbon also speeds warming and deposited black carbon increases both warming and ice melt. The global average is to the left. CO2 and these other non-CO2 substances are all important. But in the Arctic, you can see that deposited black carbon on ice and snow drives that up even more than the normal so-called Arctic amplification of carbon dioxide. And black carbon from Arctic shipping is important. Black carbon generally is from incomplete combustion, very small dark particles, very lightweight, so they can be carried for great distances, but most often they actually deposit or land very close to the source. So they generally warm when airborne, but definite warming when over and especially when it lands on snow and ice. And increased shipping will bring and is bringing more warming from both black carbon and also ozone formation to the Arctic. Uh, we don't want to neglect ozone too much. It is also a, a brings uh, negative health impacts and particle pollution simply on its own. But you can see the shipping lanes to the right there being followed by black carbon. And within Arctic shipping is likely the most single effective so-called delivery system for black carbon impacts on Arctic sea ice, on Greenland, on the Arctic climate, and therefore globally. So it may look small if you're looking at the emissions amounts, but because of where it is occurring so close to ice, it is extremely important. And you can see this here, the difference between global shipping and the impact on the Arctic and on the right within Arctic shipping and the projections moving into the future, which I should say, and you'll hear a bit later, have already sort of been exceeded. So these Arctic feedbacks, loss of reflective snow and ice increases Arctic temperature, increases global mean temperature, um, it's associated with this freshening of uh, the Arctic Ocean, permafrost thaw and emissions, sea level rise from the Greenland ice sheet, and the very large Arctic glaciers. Alaska has some of the largest glaciers in the world. Potential slowing of the um, overturning of Atlantic currents, and also potential disturbance of mid-latitude weather patterns, all of these already being observed today, and will get worse as goes on. So to end up, you know, the history of addressing black carbon in the Arctic uh, from shipping, the Arctic Council first identified shipping as an item of concern in its first report in 2008. It chose to defer and refer this most appropriately, I'd say, to IMO in 2009. There was a 2011 US, Finland, Sweden paper referring this to the IMO, and IMO has examined the issue, but a disconnect really remains between the actions and measures taken by other forums on all other relevant Arctic black carbon sources. 
The Arctic Council has come up with very specific recommendations in 2011, 2015, and came up with a joint reduction commitment in 2017. Black carbon is encompassed under the LURTAP Convention, Gothenburg Protocol, revised in 2012, and the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, where I have co-led the Agricultural Initiative, has a lot of regional and global initiatives. So while all of this has been going on, black carbon from shipping in the Arctic has increased by at least 85% since 2015. And that is a truly unprecedented increase. I don't know of any other substance that has risen at that rate, uh, either black carbon or greenhouse gas on Earth. So these other forums are also working on Arctic black carbon. The Arctic Council does have this commitment to 25 to 33% reduction and the 2021 Reykjavik ministerial statement agreed to revisit that commitment post 2025. The LURTAP convention and Gothenburg protocol is looking at a new revision that may more directly address black carbon. The European Commission with its NEC directives, the US and Canada with domestic measures. So there are other forums looking at this. And the bottom line is that with Arctic sea ice and Greenland ice and permafrost thaw already on the edge, we really need every effort to decrease the pressure and the associated risks from shipping both greenhouse gases and within Arctic BC. And I will leave you with this question. Um, since this has been raised since 2008, how much longer can the Arctic and global climate system wait on IMO? Or is it perhaps time for these other forums to take over and uh, address it more directly? Thank you so much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Pam. Um, extremely worrying, um, but also a very clear call to action. How long, indeed, are we going to have to wait um, for the IMO to act? Um, well, um, we might get a little bit of an answer to that later this week, um, but before that, um, I'd like to move um, to Brian Comer. Um, uh, Brian, the third of our speakers, is the Marine Programme Lead with ICCT, um, and, uh, and he's going to tell us um, a bit more about black carbon um, and international shipping. Over to you, Brian. Thanks, Sean. Uh, today I'll be discussing black carbon emissions from ships, including trends and policy options to protect the Arctic and the planet. I'll begin by explaining recent trends in black carbon emissions from ships in the Arctic and globally. And then I'll describe the impact of IMO's Arctic HFO ban on black carbon emissions. I'll describe the emissions reduction potential of switching from residual fuels like heavy fuel oil to distillates. And I'll explain some additional benefits of switching to distillates compared to HFO and very low sulfur fuel oil and end with some conclusions. So um, as Pam mentioned, black carbon is a climate pollutant, but it's also a health hazard. The solid particles that ships emit, including black carbon, are estimated to cause more than 6,000 premature deaths each year in the Arctic front, which is the area above 40 degrees north latitude. And the ICCT has estimated that ships emit uh, emitted 1,450 tons of black carbon above 59 degrees north latitude in 2015, and about 200 of that was emitted inside IMO's definition of the Arctic, which is shown in the blue outline on the map. Unfortunately, black carbon emissions have increased in recent years. The left panel shows how much black carbon was emitted in IMO's definition of the Arctic from HFO-fueled ships, and it shows a 72% increase between 2015 and 2019. And the middle panel is what um, Pam was just talking about. It shows that black carbon emitted from all fuels used in the Arctic, including HFO and distillates, um, have increased 85% between 2015 and 2019. And if you compare that to the global increase in black carbon emissions, which is on the right, um, that was just 8% over that same period. So this means that black carbon emissions from ships increased 10 times faster in the Arctic than the rest of the world. And you may have heard that the IMO is banning HFO in the Arctic. And in theory, this should reduce black carbon emissions because 
using distillate fuels results in fewer black carbon emissions than using heavy fuel oil. But the ban, which begins more than three years from now, uh, in July 2024, only applies in the IMO's definition of the Arctic. And um, ships that are built after August 2010 are exempt for five more years to 20, the middle of 2029. And Russia, the United States, Canada, Norway, and Denmark, these countries can grant five-year waivers to their ships uh, when they're operating in their waters, including in the EEZ, uh, in their exclusive economic zones. This slide shows a map of the uh, estimated 2019 Arctic heavy fuel oil use on the left. On the right, it shows how much HFO use would remain under the ban if it were implemented in 2019. And you can see that there's hardly any reduction in the amount of HFO used in the Arctic. And that's thanks to those exemptions and waivers that I just talked about. And in fact, due to the exemptions and waivers, the HFO ban will allow three quarters of the HFO fueled fleet to continue to use HFO. And as a consequence, um, we found that the policy will only reduce HFO carriage by 30%. It'll lower HFO use by only 16%, and it will decrease black carbon emissions by just 5%. One immediate way to reduce black carbon emissions is for ships that use residual fuels like heavy fuel oil to switch to distillates. According to our research, if the Arctic ships that use heavy fuel oil switch to distillates, their fleet-wide black carbon emissions would be reduced by 44%, which I show on the left. Because some ships in the Arctic are already using distillates, switching the HFO fueled fleet to distillates reduces total black carbon emissions in the IMO Arctic by 30%. And there's additional benefits to switching to distillates. First, using distillates reduces air pollution, including sulfur oxides and particulate matter. Second, distillates allow for the possibility of using exhaust gas after treatment technologies like diesel particulate filters or electrostatic precipitators. Both of these technologies reduce black carbon emissions by an additional 90% or more. Lastly, using distillates eliminates the risk of an HFO spill and lowers the potential spill costs. We've estimated that distillate spills are 30% less costly than very low sulfur fuel oil spills and 70% less costly than high sulfur HFO spills. So to conclude, black carbon is a climate pollutant and a health hazard. Black carbon emissions from ships are growing globally, but even more rapidly, 10 times faster in the Arctic. Switching from heavy fuel oil to distillates would immediately reduce black carbon emissions from ships. Black carbon emissions from HFO fueled Arctic ships would fall 44% and that would reduce Arctic-wide ship emissions by 30%. And switching to distillates has the added benefits of lowering air pollution, enabling the use of exhaust gas after treatment and lowering potential spill costs compared to very low sulfur fuel oil and heavy fuel oil. Thank you very much for your attention and back to you, John. Thank you, Brian. You know that um, that eighty five percent growth in BC emissions. I mean that. You know, I, I don't think there can be a clearer illustration of how, um, you know, how reckless, um, you know, and perilous, um, you know, IMO in action on these issues is. I mean, to to debate definitions and measurement methods for ten years um, when emissions are going through the roof. I mean, is is um, you know. I mean, you hear the word a lot, but it is genuinely shocking. Um, Right. Um, thank you very much for that, Brian. Brilliant. Um, well, to our last speaker, um, Dr. Tristan Smith, Associate Professor at UCL Energy Institute in London and the Director at the consultancy UMass. Um, Brian's told us all about um, black carbon. Um, Tristan, um, tell us about CO2 and shipping. <laughs> Thanks, John, and yes, happy to see what I can do in a few minutes. Um, so I'll start just with shipping's general contribution to climate change. And, you know, as you've heard from Brian and others, it, it's not limited to CO2, but in CO2 terms, shipping emits 
uh, approximately a gigaton of um, CO2, and that's across both the international fleets and the domestic fleets that are active across a number of countries globally. And um, that's you know a very sizable amount of the 40 odd gigatons, depending on exactly what you include or don't include uh, as, a, as a share, but it's also worrying because it's increasing. And whilst it did decrease approximately between um, the years 2009 and 2013, um, it has been increasing steadily since 2013, 14 onwards. And it does that because generally as a global population, we have grown in wealth and in number of people. And as we do, we tend to trade more, we want more stuff and ships carry stuff. And so, and so it's really, there's a really difficult underlying driver for shipping to have to manage, which is the fact that trade grows which makes the need for action all the more important because a growth in demand in a sector which is locked into fossil fuels gives you rising emissions if you don't do anything. So I've been asked to talk primarily about the short-term policy options because that's what we're going to be having discussions on at MEPC starting later this week. And uh, I wanted to just clarify what those are for anyone in the audience who isn't familiar. So the IMO adopted an, its initial strategy on short-term measures in 2018 and uh, within that initial strategy, which was you know, quite late in the day for a lot of sectors and other countries that have been thinking about their strategies to decarbonize. But in 2018, they said, well, we'll implement short term measures, which are measures that we can develop and, and put in place quickly, but which you know, focus on the nearer term decarbonization of shipping. So the action that could be taken this decade. And then um, we'll, we'll also have midterm and long term measures. So, the midterm timescale is approximately 2030, but it's not particularly defined in any of the documentation. So the first step, the IMO, is to get the short-term measures in place. Um, they, at the moment, after a couple of years of negotiation, since that initial strategy adoption in 2018, uh, they have been shortlisted down to two policy options, EEXI, which is a policy that requires all of the ships to meet a minimum technical efficiency standard, and then CII, which is a policy that requires ships in their operational emissions to have much uh, lower carbon intensities than a certain baseline, or to have lower carbon intensities maybe, maybe than a certain baseline. So, that, so the latter is the one that is really effective because ships, just like any appliance or vehicle, uh, it's not what they're designed to do that matters, it's how they're actually used and what the consequence of various operational decisions uh, that really has the power to change um, their emissions, especially in the short term. Um, so I guess we'll, the next bit is to then just discuss what, why, why those short term measures are important at all. Well, shipping as a sector has got many market failures and barriers that have prevented it from being as efficient as it could be. So a lot of its structure comes from, you know, centuries old contracts, which lock in certain operating practices, higher speeds than necessary, and have left a lot of technologies that could have been used to reduce emissions on the shelf. Now that doesn't mean that some progress hasn't been made and efficiency improvements were crystallized. In particular, after the financial crisis in 2009, slow steaming was, was used as a method to deal with the oversupply in the fleet and the sudden contraction in demand in global trade. And that had a, had a fortunate side effect of radically reducing the carbon intensity of ships. Um, but it's also been the major response and a lot of the technologies that we know could do something, wind assistance, air lubrication, propulsion improvements beyond those that have been fitted, have, have been left on the shelf throughout the last decade, despite an increasing awareness of climate change and risks and the need to do something about it. So the short-term measures are, are our potential to close that gap, to take all of those options that have been left on the shelf and make sure that they're actually used, which can do two things. The first thing it can do is maximize shipping's efficiency this decade and uh, help to actually create absolute reductions in emissions, such that shipping along with other sectors and countries contributes to what we know from the climate science and from the IPCC needs to be done uh, an approximate sort of halving of emissions by the time we get to 2030 in absolute terms. And, uh, and I'm not suggesting that shipping needs to do the halving, I'm suggesting that it needs to do something substantial in the context of that. Um, the other thing that you can do with energy efficiency is you can enable shipping's fuel transition. So we know the longer term story for shipping needs to be to move away from fossil fuel. That's gonna take time. We know that the fuels that shipping will likely move onto are gonna be more expensive 
and that many countries are very worried about the consequences of using more expensive food, fuel on trade, both from the perspective of the goods that they import for their standard of living and also for the export driven economic development that they rely on. And so um, having a switch to a new fuel, a more expensive fuel, uh, gets significantly cheaper if we're starting with a fleet that's already more efficient. So it's a, it's, an, it's a critical enabler and there's no good value in moving to more expensive fuels if we don't have a good efficient fleet as a starting point. The next point I'm going to make is to do with carbon pricing, because most people have um, talked about carbon pricing as a policy solution for shipping and short term measures or efficiency measures are sort of the unsexy younger brother or sister of carbon pricing, because they're both policy options that will get a lot of time spent on them at the IMO and various other forums because they have regional and national applicability as well. But we um, we need a lot of time to get to any sort of carbon pricing solution at the IMO. So I don't think carbon pricing is a solution that we should be banking on being a significant driver to reductions this decade. I mean, it would be great if it came along and it helped to facilitate a shift away from fossil fuel. But carbon pricing in a sector that has market barriers and failures does not prove in most experience to be a very cost effective way to reduce emissions. It just uses a very weak lever. If we know there are failures and barriers in markets, don't use markets to try and create change. Use command and control policy to do that because it'll be a lower cost way of implementing change. So we know that they don't necessarily have the solution for the problem that we know we're trying to solve. Uh, we know that their timescale for policy implementation is going to be very long. We, we can see that they're going to need a lot of political discussion based on the com com conversations that have already been had. And we know that the solutions that they stimulate, so the shift away from fossil fuels, take a long time to implement. They need time to build out uh, infrastructure, supply chains of new fuels, hydrogen production. I mean, these are all exciting things that will hopefully happen very quickly, but we shouldn't expect them to happen in the next year or two. And we cannot, therefore, continue to dream that um, we, we should be looking to that as the solution and not all the things that we could be doing now. So what's on the table and what is needed? The, the work that we have at the moment considers carbon intensity reductions for international shipping, which are of the order of 10 to 20 percent reductions between 2019 and 2030. And that would either increase shipping's absolute emissions or if if the demand is not very strongly growing and various factors work in shipping's favour, it might hold emissions slightly constant or a slight decline relative to their levels in 2008, the historical trend that they've been on. That's clearly as a contrast to the IPCC and, and UNFCCC uh, framing of this, not adequate to the 45, 50% reduction that we need by 2030. If you take a direct analysis of that, you can come up with numbers for the carbon intensity improvement needed to be somewhere between, we think, about 53% and others have estimated 75% uh, over the course of this decade. So a much greater scale of carbon intensity reduction um, over the course of this decade. We've tried to estimate what we think is feasible from a technolo technology perspective, just being conservative. And we do come up with a number which is lower than that. So we estimate about 30% carbon intensity improvement could be achieved um, this decade using mature on the shelf technologies. That doesn't mean that's the level that one should aim for, but you would need to do something to work beyond that and um, find the right way forwards for a sector which has an opportunity that needs to be driven, but also could um, need some time in order to move to some of the fuel solutions that will that will need be needed to get to much steeper carbon intensity reductions. What that means is that if you fail to crystallize this in the short term measure and don't achieve large carbon intensity reduction this decade is that there's a much greater rate of carbon intensity reduction the following decade. So finally, I just wanted to say what happens if IMO fails to implement what is needed from a short term measure perspective? Well, in some respects, I don't think all is lost. Shipping has a history of being regulated, not just at the IMO, but by regional and unilateral forces, member state governments of the IMO that decide that the regulations that are able to be agreed at the IMO aren't sufficient, and we do need to take action in our own hands. Um, and so I think that a failure at MEPC 76 is basically a mechanism that creates major pressure to move away from IMO-led policy on greenhouse gas emissions. Otherwise, we are complicit in what we know would be uh, letting shipping slip farther beyond 
or far behind in what um, what is needed from the scientific perspective. Um, the other consequences I've already mentioned is a postponed and therefore a squeezed decarbonisation, which is ultimately very damaging to an industry which is critical to uh, globalisation. And I think that's where the big risk is that the consequences would be damaging to the sector itself, but we won't have any choice at the point where the uh, consequences of the impacts hit as, as hard as we know they might do. Thank you. Great stuff. Thank you, Tristan. That was um, that was brilliant. Um, that was uh, everything you need to know about um, greenhouse gases and short-term measure activity, IMO, and a few extra things too, all squeezed into 10 minutes. So yes, um, brilliant. Um, thumbs up from here. Thank you very much. Um, now, I'm going to, um, fortunately for me, um, Sean is going to handle the question and answer session. So Sean, over to you. Thank you. And can I please just remind everybody to, uh, if you've got any questions, to use the Q&A option at the end, at the bottom of your page. Um, we've had one question come in already, but it'd be good to see a couple more. I have a couple myself if, if we uh, have enough time. And could I perhaps just ask the panellists to all put their cameras back on uh, so that we can see you? That would be great. Thank you. Um, the first question is actually quite a general one that I think has come from uh, Andrea Mendoza. Uh, Andrea has asked, it, bearing in mind that shipping is, is a, a form of transport, mostly of goods, um, of the panellists, is, are any of you working on consumer education? And if so, what media are, or mediums are being used to reach the general public? Um, Austin, would you like to go first? I, I expect everybody would like to take a turn at answering this, so we'll go in the order that uh, you spoke, if that's okay. Yeah, thank you, uh, Andrew, for the question. Uh, very briefly, I guess I'll touch upon how I interact with the international community. Um, I have to uh, reach out to uh, NGOs uh, primarily to get our indigenous voice across. Uh, here in the states, the United here in the states, um, in the federal government is supposed to undertake a trust, re trust responsibility uh, for tribes. Uh, unfortunately, that trust responsibility and the interaction is not as good as it should be. And so I tend to reach out to uh, my colleagues here on this, uh, on this panel uh, to help me, uh, to help us with uh, uh, you know, bringing, bringing these sorts of uh, uh, Arctic uh, concerns, uh, climate concerns uh, to the international arena. And so I, I primarily depend upon uh, the, the collaborations and partnerships that I have with NGOs uh, to to get these uh, to get these concerns across. Thank you, Pam. Would you like to go next? Yeah, I just say that what we're trying to do is bring to the general public the fact that the the changes in the Arctic have a direct impact on them, and so addressing emissions from all sources uh, is really important. And uh, we're trying to bring that home again through the impacts, not just in the Arctic, but directly on where they're living, whether that's mid-latitude weather, whether that's sea level rise um, or other you know, impacts that we're just beginning to find out about such as impacts on, on fisheries. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Sean. Um, at the ICCT, primarily um, we're working to um, provide policymakers and decision makers with the data and analysis that they need to make policies that either avoid or reduce and eventually elim eliminate pollution from ships. And they're our primary audience. Um, but at the same time, things like consumer education and reaching out to the public and making sure that our research is um, readable um, from you know, a, a general audience and can be interpreted by um, NGOs and also by the media is something that's important to us because the decision making, makers and the policy makers are responsive to their uh, respective constituencies. So um, at the ICCT, we do um, social media, we do videos, uh, fact sheets, uh, we use Twitter and LinkedIn and Facebook um, to 
explain our research and we also have um you can sign up for um our newsletter and we try and put it into plain english what what our research means we do things like this um do presentations and webinars um tristan uh, myself and then uh, another colleague from transport and environment um, named uh, fake episov were just featured in a documentary about black carbon called black trail uh, that just came out in april so um there's there's a few different ways that we actually end up uh, communicating our results to the to a more general audience Tristan, would you like to add anything? Yeah, so Brian's helpfully covered one of the things I was going to say, which is good. Uh, so yeah, any opportunity to get some of this material out into a more accessible format is is taken. But I think before we, before we need to worry as much as one could about consumer education, we also need to make sure there's consumer choice. And, that, and where we're putting a lot of our effort at the moment is in, in the retail se section, um, because retailers that bring the goods that we buy into the shops currently are failing to even recognize that they have a significant shipping emission, let alone figuring out what they do with it, and let alone giving consumers the choice to then say, well, actually, I'm, I'm now, I, I understand that, and I'm prepared to pay a small premium or to make this choice in order to differentiate between something that would have a high impact or low impact. And, that, and that's the part of the puzzle that we have at the moment. We have lots of brands that are willing to kind of paste their logos on environmental initiatives that don't really mean anything and not take the substantial action that they need to to decarbonize their supply chains and the provision of goods that we then we, we then purchase and i think uh, a lot can be done because there is so little being done at the moment that could could have a real impact and and then hopefully i think most consumers would make a natural decision in the right direction because the small change in cost that you would have from um, buying a good that did not have Arctic black carbon emissions or that did not have significant CO2 would be minuscule and uh, make it very easy for us as consumers to do the right thing. Thank you. Um, and that, that made me think back to the um, Evergreen ship, the Ever Given that, that uh, got stuck in the Suez Canal um, earlier this year. Did that make a difference? Did that help to raise consumer awareness at all? Happy, happy for anyone to jump in and respond to that. I, th I think there's this, I mean, the other point I was going to make was to do with sea blindness, because I think the question is really nicely written and saying that ships eventually transport goods. Well, <laughs> eventually is kind of the point here that they're kind of so hidden, people don't really understand them. And therefore, it's very hard for even politicians to engage in them, um, even though they could be really critical to a country's trade and uh, and it's 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 a real problem, and I think the ever given is one of a few incidents that occur every so often in very unfortunate circumstances that do help to remind people about these amazing, from a technological perspective, these amazing contraptions, and uh, that can that can help. And I've, I've seen that happen a bit. It raises consciousness, and and sadly, it's just often in the wrong way because of an environmental or a logistics of, uh, disaster. Thank you. Anyone else want to add anything? If, if not, I've got a couple of questions and please, uh, any of the attendees of, of the webinar, please do put your questions uh, into the Q&A function. Um, Pam, is it too late, uh, based on, on some of the rather horrifying facts that, that you referred to, can we turn this around? Can can we make the necessary changes that will reverse what's ha what we're seeing happen? Yes, and that's one of the most important things to remember. I think sometimes uh, people can get a bit carried away and go a bit, I mean, things are really, really bad, so I don't want to minimize that, but we still have it within our power to turn this around and to change it. The WMO came out with a communication last week that I think actually caused a lot of consternation in the scientific community because it was interpreted as meaning, oh, we're, you know, we've already blown past 1.5. We haven't done that. Um, and the IPCC and the emissions scientists, the modelers that we work with, 
um, I'm always asking them, you know, can we still do this? And they come back, the IPCC said this in uh, the special report on 1.5 degrees, and it is still true. The IEA said it just, you know, in, in April with its latest report. Uh, we can do this physically, we can do this at economic benefit, especially if the health benefits are taken into account. Um, we can do it in terms of land use. We can do it in terms of, you know, the pure technology. We don't need to actually develop any new technologies. What we're waiting for is political and social acceptability of making these changes. And that's really the, the, the burden right now and what we need to overcome. But we have all the tools available to us. And that goes for shipping as well. You know, shipping is seen of, as one of those things by the modelers that is a bit longer tail than certain other sectors, but not by much, because here again, we have those technologies. There are other sectors that are actually much harder than, than shipping. And it's important to remember also that shipping can be part of the solution if it is properly carbon neutral. Um, in Sweden today, where I'm located, a study just came out saying, you know what, our greenhouse gas emissions will go down if we stop relying so much on land transport in this very long country, right? And uh, instead do more by ship. But if we're going to do that, it has to be the right kinds of ships. Thank you. Um, Austin, you're living on the front line of, of what's happening in the Arctic. Next week, uh, or actually later this week, um, there is a meeting of the International Maritime Organization where some, hopefully some important decisions uh, will be taken. If, uh, if you could get one message across to, to the delegates at the IMO, what, what would it be? Sorry, that, that's pretty tough without giving you time to think about it, but are you able to, to give us an answer or, or would you like a moment to just think about that? Well, I, I think I would, I would respond with a question in turn, I suppose. Uh, are we climate ready? Have we uh, done the things uh, that are necessary to uh, combat the climate change we're experiencing? You know, Co you know, during COVID, uh, I thought uh, and, and would have expected that our, our greenhouse gas emissions would have uh, gone down, but it seems as though they, they've uh, they've stayed steady or maybe even gone up. And so, what happens uh, then when we turn back the you know turn the economy essentially back on as we as we open up uh, back from COVID? Are we going to are, are we are we climate ready? Are we going to have uh, climate policies that are going to uh, help us, uh, you know, turn this around. I suppose that's the question I would have then in turn for all of us to consider. Thank you. And and if I may, I might just throw that back at Brian and Tristan in, you know, in terms of, of that carbon emissions reductions and CO2 emissions reductions. Uh, how, how, how are we climate ready? Can we re make these reductions and, and what's stopping us from making these reductions? Big question to answer <laughs> at the end, but maybe I could just say on the black carbon issue in particular, uh, we've been working on this for so long at the IMO and we have um, an understanding that something as simple as a fuel switch can be something that ships can do um, immediately and would have uh, emissions reduction benefits that you could realize immediately. And uh, as Pam was saying, if you can, if you can prevent those emissions from happening in the first place, because it's a short-lived climate forcer and short-lived climate pollutant, it really helps avoid additional near-term warming, which is, that's the emergency that we're in now, it's trying to prevent as much additional near-term warming as possible. Um, so because the IMO has made this policy of the HFO ban that doesn't start until mid-2024, and even then, these exemptions and waivers were added in without uh, an analysis of their impact besides what the ICCT has done um, by itself. Um, the IMO didn't do an impact assessment of that. Um, I think it's on individual countries now to, to refuse to issue waivers to their ships. And if you could do that, instead of reducing black carbon emissions by 5%, you could reduce emissions of black carbon in the Arctic by 18%. And the maximum benefit of the fuel switch is 30%. So that's pretty good. Um, so that would be what I would say. 
is once the ban is entered into effect or even earlier. Um, but, but certainly once it's in a, into effect, countries should not issue waivers for their ships. The most important country would be Russia in this uh, instance. Uh, they have the largest fleet of HFO fueled ships that are flagged to their country, but also Canada, Denmark, uh, the United States and Norway. Thank you, Tristan. Do you want to uh, add to that? Well, we're not climate. I mean, we're not climate ready. We we're on a three degree pathway at the moment, and um, you know, if you take a very optimistic view of the rhetoric that is delivered when countries and sectors make statements, uh, you could just about push a two degree. I believe that's what the most recent analysis of the NDCs has shown. So, uh, so that tells us that that we're not there, and that's an optic, optimistic view of rhetoric. And the real problem that we have is that we don't have the detailed policies that drive the change. So there's one thing with a politician saying, I'm going to commit to X. There's a completely different process that you have to then go through in order to turn that into a detailed implementation. And what's most worrying at the IMO is that the IMO said in its 2018 initial strategy, we commit to pursuing CO2 pathways in line with the Paris Agreement temperature goals. And that was nice to secure, but then, you need to see it executed. And at the moment, if we execute a policy detail that A, as we saw at MEPC 75 the meeting last year, has no enforcement mechanism. So it relies more or less on the market doing the enforcement and not a global regulator saying, we're not gonna let you sail unless you do X. If you have no enforcement mechanism and you don't have strong enough uh, stringencies such that you expect the outcome to be constant emissions, you aren't even keeping up with the, with the rhetoric that you set. And that's that's the biggest problem here that the um, complacency because one feels that an organization or a country has made the right statement is completely complacency not actual action and um, that's and until we we can bridge those two things then uh, we have to keep pushing incredibly hard and and see what we can do Thank you. Um, I think we're, we're running out of time. Um, so, John, um, if you're ready, I'll hand back to you and let you uh, finish up. Thanks, Sean. Um, well, yeah, no, we're certainly out of time and a bit. Um, so, I mean, before concluding, thank you again to the speakers. Thank you um, for the questions. Um, and indeed, thank you to everybody who's attended and taken interest in these issues. Today's presentations have highlighted the urgent need for bold action to protect the Arctic. That's no, of that there's no doubt. Um, the IMO is responsible for addressing the climate impacts of international shipping. In the first place where action to address international shipping's contribution to the Arctic climate crisis should take place. We need both an ambitious Paris Agreement compliant short-term measure to drive ship climate pollution down as fast as possible and additional action to cut black carbon emissions from ships in or near the Arctic. Both of these issues are on the table at this week's IMO meeting. The next few years may well determine the fate of the Arctic. Time is very short, but this week's IMO meeting pre presents an important possibility for strong, bold action. And we hope that with the help of this webinar and the presenters' work, IMO member states can take advantage of it. Thank you, everybody, again, for participating and for watching. Thank you. and. Goodbye.